Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Throughout this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Now, in today's episode, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with the village of Duchess, Alberta, Deputy Mayor Deborah Reed Mickler. But before we do get into today's interview, I have a small request for those who are tuning in and watching those today's episode. Our other show, The Political Trenches Local Government at Work, is on the hunt for the top municipal stories from across Canada of 2023. We are looking for the biggest political moves, the biggest municipal shakeups, or the biggest municipal fumbles in Canada of 2023. Now, if you have a story in mind that you believe was the biggest news story municipally across Canada, message us today. Either visit the crossborderinterviews.ca website and click on the political trenches or direct message us now. Now, on to our interview. Deborah, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today and talking about yourself and talking about your community. But I want to start with you and I want to learn a little bit about who Deborah is. So I want to start with the question I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show. So you're no exception to this question. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, I think it goes back to uh, childhood, actually. I've I've been a volunteer as, as far back as I can remember, I, I, w- I was a girl guide <laughs> and a brownie. And I think that just instilled in me the whole idea that, that community matters. And I, I have found I did a lot of traveling um, with one part of my life when I was working. And I found I started to feel very disconnected because I was traveling so much with my work. I wasn't involved in the community anymore and I I, it became I realized that actually you have to be involved in your community to actually get that social piece out of it to feel connected and and I think it's a huge mental health piece too um, for people in the community to feel connected even if it's this tiny little piece of you know one day a year you show up for one event it's something that actually anchors you to to people and that social part of community. And so I think it's something I've been doing. I, I, I have a hard time saying no when people ask me to help out with things too. So it's, it's often led to me being involved in a lot of different things because people will say, well, could you help out with it? Ah, okay. <laughs> So before we get into your time as a councillor and deputy mayor of the village, I, I want to go back to your childhood a little bit. Mm-hmm. But was politics discussed at the dinner table growing up? Was politics even something that was an interest of you growing up? I, I want to know, how does someone like yourself get to become deputy mayor of your village? Uh, it's, a, it's actually kind of a funny story. And no, politics was not part of my childhood <laughs> at all. It It was, you know... Uh, growing up in a very sort of um, staid uh, family in the UK where m- most things weren't discussed at the dinner table. <laughs> um, certainly not anything that had anything to do with life. And so, you know, that was that was something that I never discussed politics with my parents or family or it was off limits. And so it was really actually getting into politics was an accident for me. And uh, it, it's my CAO's fault uh, of uh, a fact I remind her of frequently when we disagree about something. I remind her that it's her fault that I'm in politics. And uh, it came about just I went over to the town office one day, the village office to pay pay utility bill and got into a discussion with her and and the administrative assistant about something that was going on in the village. And we were just discussing the different issues that were at play. And suddenly our CAO looked at me and said, you need to run for council. And she put her hand under the counter and pulled out the package and threw it down. It happened to be an election year and said, fill this out and bring it back to me. So that was my sort of introduction to politics. And I went away with the package and looked it through and talked it over with my husband. And I said, you know, this is something I could do. I was sort of doing a bit of stay at home parenting at the time. 
And I said, this is a great way for me to give something back to this community. So that's how I ended up in politics. <laughs> so it's as I, simple as that. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know what to say, right? <laughs> because usually I'm like, oh, this is great. We're going to have a great conversation. But it kind of sounds like, and I apologize if this sounds out of left field, but you had no interest in politics prior to her putting this uh, piece of paper in front of you and saying you should run. Um, you ultimately had to make that decision, though, to put your name forward because anyone could have a piece of paper thrown in the front of their face. But you decided it was going to be something you were going to do. Um, there is a lot of people who are across uh, Alberta right now, across Saskatchewan, who are looking at potentially putting their name forward. Now, for someone who's been in office now for, I want to say, six years, if I'm not mistaken, from 2017 yeah. to 2021 to 2023 when we're recording this, is it what you expected? The last six years, was it what you expected when that CAO put that piece, of, that nomination form in front of you and said, you need to run? Um, yes, no, I did do, I, I must admit, I'm a researcher. I'm a reader and a researcher. So I, I went away and I did a lot of digging and and talked to some people that had served on council and um, talked to some people that absolutely hated it, would never do it again. Talked to some people that loved it. Um, talked to some community members. So I did a lot of research. Um, so I did know what I was getting into. Um, but I think... In many ways, it was what I was expecting. Um, the things that I didn't expect was the sheer way that it can take over your life. Um, I think I spent the first two years trying to do everything. And then the third year realizing that I had to play to my strengths. And by the fourth year, I'd kind of nailed it <laughs> and was able to, to really focus in the areas that I could make a real difference. Um, it, it's great to know everything about everything, but we just can't do that, particularly in small, smaller community rural politics. So um, I think, yes, it, it was what I was expecting. Was it something that I saw myself doing? I'd never really thought about it, but coming from a strong volunteer background, spending, I've spent years on boards and committees and helping out with community events. So it wasn't that big of a change. I think the biggest thing I would say, and I didn't do this my first year and I sort of regret it, is I actually started doing all the elected officials training after the first year. And that made a huge difference, um, not just in what I learned, but the people I met. Uh, I always joke with the people that run them. I say, you know, 50% of the value of this is from the actual information because it's very valuable, but 50% of the benefit of those courses is the network you create, the people you meet and the ideas you get to share. So it's, you, it's, it's been an interesting journey. <laughs> it, it certainly has. And I can imagine anyone in any circumstances who put their name forward in 2017 did not expect the sort of avalanche of issues that were going to come down the pipeline, particularly in that first term and particularly in that third ter year. As you said, you were getting to know yourself as mayor and uh, as councillor. Um, the world is hit by a global pandemic and municipalities start playing a different role. And now in your second term, you're dealing with this affordability crisis that a lot of municipalities are dealing with right now. Um, let's talk about the role of you as a councillor and now as deputy mayor of the village of Duchess for a few seconds, if that's okay. Yeah. And I want to know for you, is there a weight that you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chambers? Because you are making decisions that are going to impact your community locally. You make a decision, they impact them the next day. For you as a councillor, as deputy mayor, how important is it for you to be prepared in that research role to make sure you're making the right decision for your community? It's huge. It, it's actually massive, Chris, because you go into that room and you have to, I, I still remind myself almost daily um, to remember to keep that check in the back of that little squirrel on my shoulder, if you want, <laughs> that says you're here to represent the community. 
Uh, and it's one of the key things I think for municipal politicians to learn is when you go into that room, it's all about making the decision that is best for the village at the time. You, you can go in armed with all the information and all the data, but really it comes down to sitting there and saying, okay, guy, you know, is this going to work? Can we do this? Can we afford it? Um, I know we, I, I'd imagine a lot of smaller communities across the province and Saskatchewan as well, um, we operate very much on small budgets, as you know, and restricted budgets. And I know we often look at every dollar we spend as coming out of our own pockets, which it is uh, partly, it's our taxpayer dollars too. But we, we go in there when we really look and think and remind ourselves that, yeah, whatever our personal feelings, they have to be checked at the door. Um, and it's very important to wear that municipal hat when you sit around that table. Okay, but the, 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 there's another issue that you have to deal with as well, particularly in smaller communities. Now, in larger urban centers, you elect a councillor, you probably might see them from time to time at your local grocery store. But for a community like Duchess, you make a decision that is going to impact people. They're going to see you the next day. They're going to see you out and about walking, going to get gas, going to the local convenience store to grab something to bring it home. How hard is it for that aspect of the job, particularly in smaller rural communities, that when you make a decision, you know you're going to have to go defend that decision or talk about that issue at the corner store when someone approaches you and talks about it locally the next day? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I actually quite enjoy that part of it because I get to communicate with the people. Um, I actually quite like it when somebody comes and asks me why we made the decision we did, because it gives the chance to have that interaction with people. And uh, yeah, I've had the odd one or two people come up and sort of, you know, get right into my face and why would you do that? And But it's a great opportunity to actually engage and, and have that conversation. Um, because I find that sometimes misunderstanding or frustration from our, our electorate comes from just misunderstanding what's going on in the background, what's required of us. Sometimes, you know, it can be as simple as explaining to somebody that actually we are actually bound to do that. <laughs> we don't have a choice. <laughs> so it can be as simple as that or, you know, having that conversation about how you came to that decision to invest in one thing and not the other at that particular time. And I think that's really healthy. I actually enjoy that. And I've had people reach out to me and say, hey, why don't we have a splash park? And, you know, I've been able to have those conversations of, well, yes, we can look at it. Um, but bearing in mind, they can be very expensive. Uh, they can be very expensive to run. They can be very expensive to maintain. So we have to balance that out with how many staff we have, what sort of funding we have available. And I think those those conversations, quite frankly, are actually very healthy. <laughs> they are for me, and I find they are for the community too. So, so you, you talked about the after the vote happens, but there is a... I think, and I, I say this as the host of the show, and this is not the deputy mayor saying this, this is the host of the show saying this. Um, there is a big apathy when it comes to municipal politics and municipal governance in this country. And I do not want to paint a broad stroke, but I'm, I'm, I am I kind of have to ask this question. For you in your community, do you see that apathy sort of present? Are people willing to engage with you when you ask people for their opinions? Because it's great to always talk about it after the fact, but as a councillor, you have to go out and as a deputy mayor, you have to go out and ask people for their opinions. Are people willing to give their opinions to you when you have something pressing in front of your council that you say, okay, I need to have better understanding on how the residents want this to go forward instead of just me thinking of what the residents want? Yeah, it, it is a good question. And it's a conversation that, 
we keep having about, you know, being able to community engagement, public engagement. Um, we take training courses on it. <laughs> and, and I think part of the issue is that we, we've had to rethink how we publicly engage in the community. Uh, people are busy. People are tired. People are financially under pressures. Um, they don't want to be committed to having to go to, you know, engagements in the evening when they might have kids events, they might have other events going on, or they might just be plain tired. So we've got a bit creative this year, actually. We started getting a stall or table at our farmer's market. And boy, has that been fun. Um, we get, you know, give up our time on a Saturday morning to go basically man the table, give away pins, hats, uh, and just talk to people. And I know the first time we did it, we had a lot of people coming up saying, are you selling something? Do you want us to do something? You know, there was sort of that suspicion that if they were going to engage, we were going to require something of them. And we said, no, no we just want to hear how things are going. Anything you want to talk about, we're here to chat. And by the second time we did it, more of the community had realized we were going to be there. We did a couple of free draws as well, which is always good. One for the kids, one for the adults. And just had people coming by the table, just chatting. And I think that's where we maybe need to go. We, you know, we've relied very heavily on social media in recent years. And the fact that you've got to have a presence in social media and you've got to tweet and uh, or whatever. Oh, it is. Deborah, you're you've speaking my say. love language right now that social media is not the real world and people no. need to get off of it. And and that's exactly what we found that, you know, I think it's we've got to go back to grassroots and just get out in the community and show up at events. And, you know, even if you show up with your family, take that time to just turn around to somebody and start speaking to them. And even if it's a conversation about how cute the kids are in their fancy dress or to build that relationship so that the next time they see you, they go, oh, Deborah, by the way, what's happening on Second Street? Why are they ripped it up? So you're building that communication comfort level on a personal level. And I, you know, it's hard work and I don't envy the people that are in bigger centers um, to be able to do that. But I think it's something we need to go back to in, in politics in general um, is to get away from the pre-prescribed sort of messages that go out and just stand and have conversations with people and listen to them. It's like you've you've got to the, so the crux of what my show's all about here, Deborah. It is just having conversations because I think yeah. we've lost the lost art of that. But conversations can come in many different forms and municipal councillors, and I, I say this because I've spoken to many, particularly here in Alberta, are mm -hmm. being inundated with questions about jurisdictional roles that the municipality do not play in whether it be healthcare, whether it be education. Now, as a uh, deputy mayor of your community, I'm assuming you've been privy to some of these conversations where you say, we would love to help you, but unfortunately that's a provincial jurisdiction. That's a federal jurisdiction. And we as the municipality have to be within our uh, lane of our jurisdictional role as well. How often do you, when you're talking to people in your community, have to sort of clarify the jurisdictional roles? Or do you? Do people understand that the municipality deals with issues, the province deals with other issues, and the federal government deals with other issues as well? On a certain level, I think people do. Um, on the detailed level is where it sometimes gets uh, tricky. It, it, and I, I agree, it can get a little tricky. Um, we will regularly get phone calls into the office asking us to deal with the road coming through town, which doesn't we can't do anything with because it's an Alberta transport, so it's provincial. So, you know, it, it's I think you've got to maintain that communication, though, and realize that this is not front and foremost in, you know, in the public's mind. They've got again, we go back to they've got pressures. They're busy. They're trying to make 
ends meet financially. They're trying to make the best for their family and, and learning about the differentiation. So when we get those questions, I think it's really important to actually address that front on and say, you know, that's a really good question. And I often ask that myself. What we need to do, though, is take it to the province and, and partner with them rather than saying, you know, that's not my problem. Away you go. Um, and give them a phone number is to say, you know, yes, I've been hearing that or I feel that way too. And here's what I can do. We can certainly reach out and ask about it to Alberta Transport if it's a road issue or whichever department it is. Um, but you can also reach out and, and bring them into that conversation, not offload, but rather be inclusive. And, you know, I, I talked to my MLA, um, which is interesting now because, of course, we have the Premier as our MLA. But I've had conversations with my MLA um, about issues that are affecting our community that are her jurisdiction. And as Deputy Mayor, yes, I can't do anything about them, but I can certainly bring them to the, the Premier's attention or on my MLA's attention or if I get a chance to meet one of the ministers for that area to bring it to their attention too. And so I think it's it's encouraging the public and your, your, your community to realize it's a partnership. Yes, we all have different roles and responsibilities, but we can partner together to try and get that voice and try and get that message. And, you know, I do have a number of meetings with the MP too for our area. And uh, he's, he is actually very, very good at this communication piece and he gets it. And so I've learned a little bit off him about engaging with the public. So there'll be things that maybe he can't as a federal politician, but he can relate to and say, you know, that is important to our community. What we need to do is take that to the province, what we need to, so we have to work together. It has to be a partnership at all three levels of government in order for all of us to succeed. And so I think getting that message too, and bringing the public or bringing that person that's asked you this question on board as a partner, rather than, you know, hey, that's not my problem. <laughs> Here's a phone number. <laughs> Just and that's hard because we get busy. But your your MP is Martin Shield, right? He is indeed. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good old memories working for me today. Um, yes. So you, you over the last six years, I'm assuming you've had to make some very tough decisions. And yeah. now you know you're not going to please 100% of the people with those decisions. And it's probably something that you have to sort of struggle with because you want the better good. And at the end of the day, sometimes the better good is not going to be good for every single person, but it's going to be good for the majority of people. How do you balance the needs of the community with the individual needs? Because everyone has their own issues. And we're going to talk about the issues of the village here from your perspective in a few minutes. But as a councillor, as a deputy mayor, you have to make the tough choices. And sometimes that means you're going to have to upset people. How do you do that, especially in a small town where we've talked about where you get mm -hmm. approached at the end of the day and you get approached and ask, why did you vote this way? It's affecting me. You know, people are struggling right now and the budget, I'm assuming you're just about to go through it or you've already started to go through it. Um, right now, people are struggling and you are potentially going to impact their pocketbook. So you have to look at the balance of how do we continue to move the village forward with not doing it on the backs of the people who are there right now. So in your role, how do you see you're balancing the individuals with the community as a whole? Yeah, it, you know, that's something we all struggle with. Um, we've got a good council at the moment, and I know we have many conversations about this, where, how do we balance that? And, and I, <laughs> You know, it's hard. We're all going through that right now. Personally, professionally, businesses are going through it about making that balance. But I think at the end of the day, I always, my question to myself is, did I look at all the factors? Did I do my research? Did I understand fully what was going on? And did I make the best possible decision that I could make at the time 
for my community as a broader whole. And yeah, you're never going to you're never going to please 100% of the people 100% of the time. Does it get and, easier? Um, I think it depends on the decisions sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> True. And and it can be it can also depend on strange things about what's going on in the social world, in the social media world. It, it's, it's sometimes odd the things that can blindside you as a council um, that weren't even on the radar and suddenly become an issue at the table. And so it's also always a case of just sitting there and looking at it and saying, okay, where's this coming from? What's the, because sometimes there's, there's a reason it's coming forward. And you, you just have to go into everything with a very calm, very cool head to remove. And we remind it, we're, we're quite good friends on our council too, even though we disagree and we will not all vote in favor of something all the time. And we've disagreed across the table and we agree to disagree. Um, but I think that's healthy. But at the end of the day, we can walk away from that table and get along again. And I think that's important. And it's something that at the municipal level, I think we need to impress upon people that that's the way society needs to go forward for us all to work together, is to be able to work with people you don't agree with, or that you don't have the same approach to a problem as and come to a decision at the end of the day that's going to be best for the community and the people. Does it come down to one. respect? Yes, absolutely. How much respect does it come? How important does respect come into play? Because you're right. You're not going to agree with 100% of the people around your council table, let alone in your community. But you have to then make a decision good, bad, or indifferent, whether you vote against it or vote for it. And if it passes, it passes. If it doesn't, you have to respect the will of the council that it has gone a certain way. But you then have to go out and sell that to the general public. You have your personal opinions. You voted the way you can tell people you voted, but this is how council decided. And this is how council has proceeded with this issue. But there has to be a respect for you enough to do that, to go out and sell it to the people after a decision is made, how much respect comes into play uh, for you and for your council to ensure that good, bad, and different, the next day you're going to have to get up and make those decisions again the next day, the next council meeting, the next committee of the whole. Does respect come into play on a regular basis for you? It's huge. And I, I think it's something that you have to sit back and look at and and question yourself. If you're not respecting the people around the table, you've got to ask yourself why. And I think, you know, we all come from different parts of life with different stories, with different experiences. Uh, the important thing is to respect the people you work with and the people you communicate with for the, the value and the work that they're doing okay, they might not have the same background as you, they might not have the same experiences, but they have experiences and they have thoughts and ideas and feelings. And though, when you enter into a conversation with somebody, you have to find that mutual ground. What's, what's the thing that we do agree on? Where, where can we find that mutual peace uh, and go forward with it? And over the years, um, there I have one counselor on council when I first uh, met that councillor when they first got elected I was a bit taken aback and the next council meeting I was going to I thought no I'm going to go in I'm going to experience that councillor for their experience and their knowledge and over the years that councillor has actually turned out to be one of the most um, influential to me because being completely different from my approach, that person has influenced how, uh, for the better, how I sometimes do things. I've learned from them and I've learned skills from them. And I think that's something that we always have to remind ourselves to do. 
even if we don't agree with, uh, and we have to work intermunicipality wise in this area too. We have intermunicipal meetings and I know there's a lot of feelings out there that flutter around and people say that, you know, oh, you know, he said, she said, and I think we need to step away from that because as I said to somebody the other day, it's much harder to be mean about somebody that you have a relationship with. Okay, maybe they're not your best friend, but you've had coffee with, you've sat and talked over issues with. It's a lot harder to go back and be mean about that person once that relationship is in place. And so that's part of our, to me, that's part of what we need to do more of is building those positive relationships and understanding that at times we're gonna have to look at each other and say, sorry, we're never gonna agree on this point. And let's move on. And it, it happens even, um, you know, at board levels that I go to, we look across the table. And that's where that respect comes in, that mutual respect, that it comes down to we're all there with the best intentions at heart. And so you have what, to have that. So while we've talked about respect at the council table, there's another respect that has to come into play as well. Because, and you've talked about it a little bit beforehand, but I want to dive into a little bit deeper if that's okay. And it's the respect of the people. Because you have been elected to do this job. You have been put there by the people. And I've looked and I can say that you've not been elected by 100% of the people every single election you've ran in. So there are people who just don't agree with you and you have to talk to them as well. You have to respect them enough because you are their elected official to talk to them, to listen to their priorities, listen to their issues that they are having and respect them enough that they are an equal partner in the village or their community as the people who voted for you. But and the, the caveat here is they have to do it in a respectful manner. I can imagine getting yelled at at the corner store or getting yelled at on social media is probably not part of the job you signed up for, but you have to listen to some people who do that, but in a respectful manner. If they're swearing at you, calling you names, you don't want to do that because you don't want to be put into that position. And I would never want anyone to be put into that position. How important is it to you for you to listen to everyone, all sides of the story, and not just the echo chamber that is your friends, your family, the people who have voted for you, the council members around your table? Is there respect that comes into play when you're dealing with the residents as well? Absolutely. Um, I, I think I, I mentioned that earlier. There's nothing yeah. I like better than having that conversation out in the community. And honestly, I love to hear people's opinions and ideas and thoughts because a lot of the time I'm learning new things. Again, I might not always agree with 100%, but you know, even the people that have very, very specific on ideas on a particular topic you can always learn something from them always there's always a nugget in there somewhere e even the people that can get into sometimes being a bit abusive there's a nugget in there and and listening and and talking to them and getting them to talk it through sometimes it elucidates that little nugget that might be driving what's going on where's the information I, I find a lot of times when people are getting angry to find out where the information came from <laughs> is key can, can i just take a wild guess and ask where i'm assuming it's probably always social media <laughs> but you know what the perspectives are and, and where the research has come from and and having those conversations about okay yeah there's there's research that proves that but have you seen the other research is there any out there and sometimes i will ask them um i don't know is there research that says the opposite do you know do you know who commissioned the study and, and sometimes it's, and depending on who you're talking to, how detailed they're going, obviously you don't want to start challenging somebody at that level if, if they're just wanting to vent. And sometimes it's a good idea just to let them vent. To how, be honest. how often is that? How often do you come across that? People just want to be heard because in your role, 
I can imagine people want to talk to you, but sometimes they just want to be heard and feel like they have been heard. So you have to respect them that they have a different opinion than you, and you have to just hear them out and let them vent and let them have that conversation with you, even though you may not agree 100% of what they're saying to you. It's, I think it's critical because I think at the end of the day, we're human beings. We all want to feel that we're heard and we need to be heard um, in a community. And I think that that's important that people feel like they're heard and they're listened to. And even I think most of us at, at the at the root of who we are and our being and being in a community at, at heart, most of us know that we have to compromise. And most of us know that we're not going to get our own way 100 percent of the time. But it's that piece of being heard. And I find a lot of divisive politics in recent years. I, I think a lot of it has come from the fact that people don't think that they're heard anymore, that they're respected, listened to. And I think it's something that in the municipal world, we as leaders can start to turn that around. I, I really do. I think that getting out there and just listening and talking and having conversations and letting people vent sometimes as long as they're not abusive or you know it doesn't get into a personal safety issue it, it sometimes it's very therapeutic <laughs> we all know that <laughs> to have a vent um i just looked at the clock and i did not realize <laughs> we've already been chatting for a half hour <laughs> and I haven't even got to segment two of the show yet. And I'm going to turn there because hopefully you have a few extra minutes after the time that I said that we were going to be here uh, to continue talking because I find this conversation so fascinating so far. But I want to turn to the village as a whole now. Mm -hmm. And I want to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the deputy mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a policy of council. This is a opinion of the deputy mayor. Now, yep. I had Tony, your mayor, on earlier this year, and now I'm going to ask you because things may have changed over the last few months since we, uh, the mayor and I chatted. But in your opinion, what do you see as the biggest issue facing the village of Duchess today as of recording this episode? The biggest issue we face right now is we need to be able to build for growth and we're not able to. Uh, financially that's where we're struggling to to actually start to build um the infrastructure that we need and by infrastructure i find that a lot of times infrastructure is so unsexy in the political world but to be able to hook people up to water and wastewater so that they they can flush their toilets and have their showers that piece for us as a smaller community um, where we do get relatively a lot less funding and we are restricted in how much tax dollars we can raise. There is a, a limit. That's the piece for us that's a real challenge right now because we have a housing shortage. We know we do. Um, we have what the local realtor said is effectively a 0% availability for housing stock which means that the houses that are on the market for us are either not priced to sell or they're not fit for habitation. So they're, they're being sold almost as a lot of land. So we need to figure out as a community right now, how we move to get some, we've got a piece of land that we, we can use, we own it, but we don't have water and sewer and roads in it. And so for that, that is a huge challenge for us because we know we've got seniors living in four bedroom houses that would love to live in something slightly smaller. Um, and that would free up a family home, but they will not move because they will not move out of the village. And I don't blame them. I wouldn't want to either. We love our village and we love our community. So that's one of the biggest challenges facing us right now. And when you're a smaller community, the, you know, there's a lot of talk about, well, there's a grant for this and there's a grant for that. You can get grants under this um, ministry for roads. You can get grants for uh, wastewater and they're all under different departments. 
the sheer number of the grants that are out there and the work that that takes, we just don't have the capacity. We run with two staff. We run very lean. Um, so to take that time out to go, what we call it, grant chasing, um, which is what it is. You have to go out and chase grants. Uh, we're, we're down to one thing. We either pick one and pray and put all our eggs in that, or we, we start paying um, consultants to do this work for us. And that comes with a whole set of challenges, which we haven't got time to get into today. So that's one of the biggest challenges we face is, is just getting, getting access to the dollars that would help us to do this, but also how do we manage that as a small community to enable our community to grow? Because we need housing. We need places for our seniors. We need more family homes. We've got people that are coming to us constantly. We have people going into the village office asking if they know if there's going to be Bernie building because they want to buy a home. And in fact, this last year, the house next door to me didn't even make it on the market. It was sold by word of mouth. So anything that's worth buying is just gone because... So I, I, okay, I, I agree with you one hundred percent. Infrastructure is not sexy. No, but I'm gonna. I try to make it sexy on this show by saying this. You, like many other, and I say you as in the royal village, you, not just you as deputy mm -hmm. mayor, but you, the village of Duchess, are in the same position of as many other small municipalities across Alberta right now. Yeah. Infrastructure is a key issue that they're facing. And the issue with the infrastructure is you need buildings to put in that infrastructure, but builders will not come until the infrastructure is in place. So it's the old age old adage to what do you put forth, the chicken or the egg, which came first. And for municipalities who want to grow, you know you can't do it on the base that you have right in place right now. You can't do it on the backs of your community members because they're struggling already. But you mm -hmm. have to look at the future and try to figure out how you're going to do this. Now, the villages of Duchess is in a unique position. You only have two employers, two employees in the office. I'm assuming you have some public works people as well, but two people yeah. in the office. How do you see your role as deputy mayor, as council, as trying to address these issues here and now, because if you continue the way that you're going, growth is not going to happen. So you have to try and figure out how to balance growth with the people that you have, with the understanding that if you don't grow, you're not going to have those houses being built because the infrastructure needs to be put in place before the builders come in and start building the houses. I think this is one of these areas where uh, as a small, you know, smaller municipality, um, council does actually get a little more involved than they may in a larger centre, because we have to support our CAO. There is only X number of hours in the day um, that she has uh, for all the work that she does. And so we we have to step in sometimes and, and help play that supporting role. And myself and the mayor have become a lot more active in recent months, um, supporting her in, we work together and, and say, okay, what can we take off your plate? Do you need us to go talk to, to people? Can we, can we sort of look, do some research on grants for you and come back and for you with some information. So it's it's a bit about sharing the responsibilities. And this is where it gets interesting. There's always the joke in small, small municipal politics that, yeah, we don't get to drive the grader. You know, that's one of the big jokes that sits around. Um, but there's, there is an interesting line. And I think this is where having a really good partnership with your CAO uh, comes into play that you can be honest enough with each other. And, and my CEO is excellent. She will let us know straight away if we're straying into territory we, we shouldn't be in. But she's also incredibly supportive of the work that we're trying to do to help her to, to move the village along because we all recognize that we need to grow. 
And so how best do we do that? And some of that is talking to provincial politicians, provincial ministries, trying to find out what can we do as a village to partner with you? What's going to work? Um, some of that is looking at the grants and saying, okay, what's achievable? And, and if, if these grants are barriers to us, making sure that our MLA, our MP know about it, telling them, look, this is a, this is a problem. And I was in a meeting with um, MP Shields recently, and one of the municipalities did bring this up. He, he said, you know, hey, Martin, have you heard this? This is a problem. We're, we're having trouble with this federal grant. So I think that goes back to we all need to work together. And I, th I think for us right now, we're just looking for answers um, in any way, shape or form that we can find <laughs> and, and chasing every possible lead uh, and keep talking to, to people. We are challenged, yes, because construction companies, builders will not come in. Um, we've had builders say to us, look, I'm sorry, there's not an incentive you can offer me short of cutting me a $400,000 check to make me come and build when I can build in Calgary or I can build in Lethbridge or I can build in Medicine Hat and I can sell my home for far more than it's going to yield in the village of Duchess. So I think challenges like that is where we have to work together. We need to talk to the provincial government. We need to get into meetings and into rooms talking with provincial government officials saying, look, these are our challenges. Um, how do we work together? How do we work with you to overcome these challenges? Because we can't do it on our own. They can't do it on their own. We have to work together. I, I'm going to ask a very political question here, and I apologize if it comes out of left field, but I think you're ready for it because uh, I've, I've known yeah. you now for about 40, for, for about 44 <laughs> minutes. So I think we're ready. I think we're on a mutual name, first name basis here, Deborah. <laughs> Are you being heard, though? I do believe we are at the moment, actually. Okay. I think there's been a shift. And I've had a couple of light bulb moments in recent months sitting in meetings um, with ministers where things have been said that have actually caused me to have a bit of a light bulb moment and realize that, okay, there is ways we can absolutely work together. And yes, they, they are trying to hear us. And I think we need to, all of us, we're all elected politicians, whether we're federal, provincial or municipal, we need to put those hats back on of who, how best to serve the communities and, and work together to do that. And I think there's, there's some glimmers. Like I said, I, I've had a few light bulb moments in recent months that have given me cause to hope and also given me cause to reach out and do a bit more communicating myself. Now, I, I appreciate your candor there. And I, I, I am very cautious of time here because I, I feel yeah. like we were talking about a lot. But I want to ask this question because I have been accused by a counselor in Alberta. I'm not going to mention any names, Mrs. Car Cara Brazo, of only talking about the negative issues of municipalities. I want to talk about the good things that you're doing. Yeah. And I want to ask this sort of point blank question because I know you just got back from Alberta municipalities. I, I, I'm assuming you were up in Edmonton for RMA as well. You might not have been, but I know you were up a meeting with the board. What do you boast about? that gets that the village of Duchess gets right. What is the thing that you talk about to other municipalities and say, you know what, you might be doing it great. We're doing it better. This is the issue that we got right. And we are proud that we've gotten it right. What is that issue for you? Well, I don't know if it's an issue, but I think one of the things that makes us know that we get it right is people don't want to leave this village. <laughs> We have an awful lot of our community that come to us and say, absolutely no way are they moving from Duchess because this is this is their community. They love it. Um, they, they love everything about it. Oh, there's always things you want to fix. 
But I think one of the things, and I mean, this goes back way before my day, Chris. So I, you know, I, I'll brag on behalf of my my previous councillors and councils from Duchess is we've been very, very good at managing to do immense work on very little money. Um, I often joke that uh, my 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 staff and my council, we're all cheap. <laughs> and I use that as kind of a joke, but I, I, I'm not really, in a way we are. We're always looking for the most cost-effective way to do anything, whether it be, um, you know, a, a, a meet and greet event right up to replacing a piece of equipment. It's not just a case of just going out and splashing the cash. It's how do we get the really the best bang for our buck? And this this is an ethic that's been in Duchess Council since long before my time. But I'm actually very proud of it. We we do things with great thought and great um, care and precision. And when we're spending those dollars, we're making sure that we're doing, okay, what needs to be done first? It's nice to have all the pretty flowery things, but quite honestly, your water, your sewer, your roads need to be there first. And so we've also always made that a priority. Um, the other things that I will brag about in our community, I mean, we all say we've got great volunteers, and and we do and a lot of smaller communities will say we've got awesome volunteers what i like about our community is we've got young volunteers too um coming through the ranks our youth are very active we've been lucky also in the fact that we've got a really well balanced population percentage for a small community and a village in rural alberta we actually have quite a high percentage of under 24s. And we have a very balanced percentage of working people and a balanced percentage of, of seniors. And we've been very proud over the years of, of balancing those the needs of all of those people and, and making it a place where, yes, our youth we have young people that say, I want to go, I've got to go to college, but I want to come back. I want to work and live from Duchess. I want to work in this region. And, and that's one of the things that I love having conversations with people about is how do we get to that point where our youth can come back and there is a whole range of career and life opportunities on offer to them so that they can have their homes in Duchess and raise their families in Duchess and be part of the community. So that's something you, I brag about. You, you've talked a lot about the macro issues that are being facing and you talk about sort of the challenges that your, your community faces. Um, I, I, I can imagine, and I was actually, I had the pleasure of visiting Duchess earlier this summer uh, when I was out giving a tour of South, uh, Southeast Western uh, Alberta, and I stopped in Duchess, and I actually saw one of your big giant farmers markets happening, and I couldn't believe how many people were actually out at one of these things, because you don't traditionally see this in the media, right? You don't see this in the news that people are out attending these types of events, but I, I had the pleasure of talking to a few people while I was there. It wasn't a lot. I think I talked about five people because I, I think they were wondering who this random person was stopping in their community was. <laughs> and and I, I get that. I've gotten that a few times across uh, uh, my travels. Um, but when I asked them what their issues are, they talked about some those major macro issues, but they also talked about those micro issues. And your community, you guys have a shining example of what a community is because people want to actually talk and get be engaged. But you know, at the end of the day, you only have an a limited supply of money to address the issues that are facing your community. And that means some people are going to go without. Sometimes you're going to have to say no to people. And I can imagine in a small community yourself, you seem to be a people pleaser who wants the best for their community you're not going to address every single issue every single year. And it's probably a challenge for you because you want to be able to help everyone. Is it hard to say no in a small town when you know you want the best for your community, but sometimes the issues that people bring to you, you're just unable to do it because you just do not have the resources to address the issues that people are talking about? Yeah. 
Oh yeah, it's it's very hard. Um, one of the ones that comes back perennially for a lot of small communities is a summer swimming pool. Everybody wants a swimming pool. How'd and, you know that that was two things that people <laughs> talked about there, yep, Deborah? The swimming pool. <laughs> So what we did, and that came back uh, this year, um, front and center for us, because with the heat and people were struggling um, with the cost of living and running air conditioning units, back to that, how do we tackle the heat? So we had a few members of the public coming to us and saying, look, we need, we need a pool, we need this. And, and we sort of, we talked to them about, okay, this is a, it's a huge cost. We also have pools in neighboring communities. But is there a something that we could do that would be affordable, that wouldn't be a taxpayer burden, that would provide some sort of outlet? So we actually had people come back to us and say, you know, okay, what about a splash park? Okay, you know what? There might be funding coming up for recreation. Let us look into it. Not no, let's see what we can do. It might not be a huge one, it might not be this massive, but can we put a small splash park in that provides that area? Um, then we talked about, we had a community member say, well, okay, I get that maybe a pool is a bridge too far, but what about providing some shade for families? So we went, you know what? That's a really good idea. <laughs> very, very simple. Can we pop some shade into some of our parks and around our walking paths so that families out in the, in the heat of the day can stay outside, but get a break from the heat. And we looked into it and went, you know what, the cost isn't that much. And in fact, then our public works foreman came back and said, actually, I can do it cheaper. Let's get the summer students, let's build one. And that's what they did. And we actually had an, uh, a letter from one of the residents that put this forward. And, and it was the most wonderful letter because he opened it by, you would not believe the fact that I screamed at the top of my voice when I came around the corner in my minivan with my kids to the point that my kids told me, shut up, dad, what, <laughs> what are you doing? And he said, I have written to politicians for many, many years. And I don't think anybody has ever done one thing that I've asked for. And he just said, I, I wanna thank you for the bottom of my heart for restoring my faith in politics. Because I came forward to you with a, a number of suggestions. One of his was also the swimming pool. And he said, you not only responded to me, you gave me explanations as to why there were pros and cons. And then you went out and did something that I asked for. So I think sometimes, you know, it, it may be about having, it's goes back to that nugget, nugget and those in-depth conversations and getting to the root of things because we were able by engaging these community members to elicit something that we could do and we could do straight away that made them feel like they were being heard. And we also got that chance to have that conversation about why swimming pool might be a little bit out of our financial reach right now. <laughs> <laughs> which was great and you know what not one of them didn't understand why once we explained to them the costs that were involved and the impact that that could potentially have on the village uh in terms of you know fiscally being able to to meet that need and it was the fact that we could go back to them and give them, okay, well, yeah, we're really sorry. We can't do the swimming pool right now, but how about we do a couple of things that we can do and start working on something that might be a possibility in a year or two's time. I want to end on one last question for you. And I, yeah. I have taken way too much of your time and I apologize, but I want to ask you this very important million dollar question I, because I think it's a question that every municipal leader knows how to answer. It just, I like hearing it from them. In your opinion, what makes the village of Duchess such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Oh, I love all the, you always get the answers of the community and the people, and, and they are so important. Um, but I, I also think it's also about uh 
the things that go on and participating. And you may, you alluded to it earlier. You said, I came out and there was a farmer's market event and there was all these people out there and we forget. I think those events in our communities provide that great opportunity for people to just reconnect with real social interaction. <laughs> And I think that's what makes small communities and Duchess in particular so such a great place to live is that those little events, those little activities, and I, I call them little because they're not experiences with the tourism capital E. They're uh, a movie in the park. They're a hot dog morning. They're a coffee and donut morning. But those are the things that I think really connect people back into their community and hugely play into that mental health and wellness piece. That sense of community, that sense of belonging that to me is vital for all of us. Deborah? And so that's what I'm gonna say. <laughs> I appreciate that. And I, I, I wanna take a moment and say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule, for sitting down with me longer than I had asked for. But this has been probably one of the most enlightening conversations I've had in a very long time. So I do appreciate you taking time in doing this and also for serving your community. I don't think municipal leaders hear that enough. And I just want to say it more often. You truly do make an impact in your community. Sometimes you hear about it, sometimes you don't, but I think you often should hear about it more often than you probably do already. So thank you. Thank you so much thank for you. serving and thank you so much for being part of the show. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Chris. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light onto the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help continue us to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking. <laughs>